Uh, he's been part of this Pan-African team uh, with whom uh, our late Prime Minister Mele Zenawi used to actually have full day, closed door, open agenda type of interaction to brainstorm on how Ethiopia should proceed in terms of its development policies, how it should deal with its region, how it should deal with the uh, multinational monopoly dominated globalization, how to deal with the multilateral institutions, your IMFs, your World Banks, your WTOs, etc. So that engagement is a rare, a rare thing. I know very few Africans who have had that kind of perspective to look at the entire con continent, but also follow this unique path that Ethiopia has taken that in my view is perhaps a, a miraculous and very successful path. It's been a common perspective as well among many, especially in the development cooperation community and other places, to either not appreciate what happened here, to keep it hidden from the, the African, uh, basically, development learning, uh, from the African development learning uh, systems, and therefore, if we actually miss out on a real appreciation and a rigorous study of the actual narrative of the challenges and so on, then basically it becomes very easy to simply fall back on the neoliberal, on the common knowledge type of uh, advice uh, that, that, that originates from many Western countries, from the IMF, from the World Bank, and it will appear, uh, it will appear like a this, this, this 27 years, 28 years of history is something that you can easily dismiss. So basically, um, uh, Charles Abugre also had headed the UNDP's Millennium Development Campaign for, as a director of that campaign for all of Africa. That also gave him a unique opportunity of having, having actually interacted with almost every single African, African country, in South, especially in Sub-Sahara. Therefore, I'm very happy that uh, he joined us today to actually give us his overall perspective, his narrative, and then also to caution us on which way, which path to follow in the future. I give you my friend and colleague, Charles Abouk. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Rajana forgot to say that uh, he also worked, we worked together in uh, Ghana, and he's been to my village, and uh, he's been working in northern Ghana. Um, the last for, for quite a while. Um, seven years altogether. Yeah. Seven years altogether. Now. So he knows Ghana also quite well. Um, and he knows that my part of Ghana has a very similar weather and development characteristics as uh, Tigray. And um, so, in a sense, we also share some affinity on uh, the challenges of trying to pull an economy uh, in the 16th century to the 21st century. Um, so it's an old thing. And uh, the last time I was in Tigray, I drove from Asmara uh, to Makala. It took me two days. And I tried to drive to Addis. 
four and a half hours later, we abandoned the vehicle and waited for our vehicle to come bring us this back this way. The roads were horrendous. I think many of you, some of you know the conditions at that time a lot more than some of us have visitors. But it's important to start like this because it reminds us somehow the journeys that we have traveled to this, to this point. Um, Mizani asked me to kind of touch in a very comparative way the paths that say Ghana and other African countries are taking, where those paths have intersected with Ethiopia's development paths and where we have diverged and the lessons in it for both sides. Actually, I am largely here because I am traveling around Ethiopian farms to see what lessons one can learn from the way agriculture in the last uh, decade or so has been changing. So I can apply it to my part of the country. That's really the reason why I came this time trying to learn about agriculture. And um, there are so many comparative lessons. So I would draw on some, some other things, some other countries to make a point, but I'll try and stay in the Ghana, Ethiopia uh, comparators to see whether one that can be a little clearer on some of the things I want to say. First, it's difficult to compare Ghana and Ethiopia. Ghana is a very small economy, a very small population at the moment, about 30 million. Ethiopia is now more than 100 million. It's a small size, uh, in flatter, much easier to deal with than the topography of Ethiopia. It's more hilly, more complex, more expensive to, to manage. So a vast country with very difficult topography is a harsh starting point for transformation. We are smaller, but when we go back to the 1960s, this was 1960 or thereabout was a time where at least in terms of ideas, aspirations, and dreams, Ghana and Ethiopia converged. You, you only now know about Ghana, either about Kwame Nkrumah or Kofi Annan, and if you are a footballer, then a Samoa Jan. <laughs> but the 1960s was very interesting. In spite of the differences in sizes and topography, they shared something common. Population density was very, very small. Urbanization rates in Ethiopia in the 1960s was only 11%. Only 11% of Ethiopians in the 1960s lived in anything called urban. These are not mega cities, but it's a, a body defined by law as to the minimum numbers of people that can be classified as urban. In 1960, Ghana was slightly better, around 18%. But the population size in Ghana in the 1960 was only 3.5 million. Ethiopia was about 22, 25 million at the time. But that vast space in 25, 25 million with a small urban population, similar in Ghana, with a small urban population, makes industrial development almost an impossibility. There's just not enough concentration of labor and skills and domestic demand to make industry viable. And distances for international trade were equally vast 
and defined at that time by technology. You really had to go via slow steamboats to, 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 to sell your goods back and forth. Yet, in the 1960s was when our leaders dared to dream. It was like taking a 15th, 16th century economy and trying to pull it into the 20th century at that time. With all the old stuck against you. At that time, Ghana uh, was slightly higher in terms of the average number of years that a Ghanaian went to school. And at that time, it was actually <coughs> average was six months. That is, if you divided everybody's schooling by the number of population divided by years, the average Ghanaian went to school for six months. At that time, the average Korean had gone to school for five years. So if you believe that economic development is really about skills and about knowledge, then our starting points were exceedingly harsh. Yet, this was a time when the industries that still survive in Ghana today were established. Similar to Ethiopia, the backbone upon which further change happened started in the most difficult times of our histories. That was as far as convergence went. Nkrumah was overthrown, Hale Selassie left, we went into our different paths of turbulence. So in our case, we, or in both cases, we had military regimes. Following the military regimes, Ethiopia went into conflict. Ghana stayed in the military regimes without an obvious large-scale conflict. But both have their opportunities and challenges. So from the 1980s, Ghana became a star principle, a, a, a star people of the dominant thinking of economic development at that time, in the 1980s. So from being a star post-independence country that quickly went into crisis after a CIA-inspired coup against uh, Kwame Nkrumah, <coughs> we became another star principle, people, which was the biggest experiment of how an economy ought to be transformed using principles that suggested dismantling the prominent role of the state in the economy. And so the argument there at that time was that the private sector is not growing because the state is dominating the space and squashing the private sector. Everything has to be done to control the private sector in the entire economy. And now remember the entire economy is not just production of tangible goods, it is also services. That means it is education, it is healthcare, it is even uh, distribution, it is storage systems, it is food buffer stocks. It's the entire architecture of the economy. So we were one of the countries that went through the most excruciating experiences of what it takes to remove the state almost entirely from the economy. 